uh, definitely a joy and a privilege to be with you. Um, like Nick said, um, my name is Ben. Uh, I've been in Ukraine now for over 11 years, um, so I guess you could say long term. Um, my wife has been there for over 34 years because she was born there. Uh, she's Ukrainian. Um, I will get into a lot more detail about the city that we're at uh, and just what God is doing there in our context and in Ukraine as a whole. But first I want to share with you guys a little bit about mission in general. And uh, I know it might seem cliche when a missionary comes to share. You're like, hmm, I wonder what he's going to share about. Well, I know mission, right? Um, and yet I pray that God's spirit would use what we're going to talk about today to stir up your hearts, uh, maybe even to confirm something for someone that he's been speaking to you uh, recently. So today I just want to look at three simple questions, and those questions are these. Why should we care about mission? Who is called to mission? And how can we be involved in mission? Okay, why should we care about mission? Who is called to mission? And how can we be involved in mission? Uh, First of all, why should we even care about mission? I don't think that I have to convince many of you uh, of the importance of mission. We've heard a lot about it already today. Um, Most of us are familiar with what's usually called the Great Commission. That's in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, You can open and read it with me or just listen. Uh, Matthew 28, um, and specifically I want to highlight Jesus' words in verse 19. This is after Jesus has already been crucified and is risen from the dead. He's with his disciples before he ascends back to heaven. And in verse 19 he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, we're most familiar with this version here in Matthew, but actually, if you look at any one of the Gospels, uh, at the end of any of the Gospels, you'll see that same call to mission. In John chapter 20, Jesus simply says to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Um, Now, most of you probably forgot your Latin Bibles at home today. Uh, But if you had a Latin Bible, you would see that the word send there literally is missio in Latin. It's where we get our English term mission, right? So Jesus is basically saying that as I am on mission from the Father, now you, my disciples, are on mission from me. So it's pretty clear right away that there is a huge emphasis in Scripture on mission, that it is important that we are called as followers of Christ, to mission. But here's the question, why? Why does God call us to mission? And the truth is that unless we understand why he calls us to mission, the commission is not actually going to seem very great. It might seem like just some hollow obligation or maybe even an unfortunate burden that we have to deal with. Unfortunately, a lot of times I think Christians can have a wrong understanding of why God calls us to mission, and that in turn twists our perception of mission itself. One common misunderstanding that Christians unfortunately often have concerning why we're called to mission, why God calls us to spread the gospel, is that, well, you know, here's this great mission to reach the world with the gospel, and God needs our help doing it right? You should be laughing. God doesn't need our help, you guys, right? God didn't need our help in accomplishing our salvation on the cross. God didn't need our help in rising again from the grave, and he certainly doesn't need our help now in spreading that message to the world. If our understanding of mission is built on this idea that, well, you know, here's the mission, God needs my help to finish it, and it's a good thing I'm on his team. He kind of lucked out on that one. Right? If, if that's our, and maybe we wouldn't even say that out loud, and yet in our hearts we think, well, yeah, of course God needs my help. If we have that understanding, we're actually insulting God, and we're making way too much out of ourselves. Right? If we have that understanding, um, the truth is that we're probably also going to present a skewed version of the gospel where God also needs our help to save us where our salvation ultimately depends on us. And that's no gospel at all. 
closely tied with that, uh, another false understanding concerning mission that unfortunately oftentimes Christians hold is that uh, when we think of, of mission and fulfilling the Great Commission, uh, we try to do that in a sense in order to, to earn God's favor, to be on his good side, right? And again, we might not say that that blatantly out loud, but when we think about how God feels about us, how he accepts us, uh, oftentimes that is in proportion to how well we think we are or are not fulfilling that great commission. But the truth is that anybody who sees the call to mission in that light, anybody who has that understanding can't preach the gospel. Why? Because that's not the gospel. Right? That's not good news. That's actually very bad news. I don't know, maybe you guys are all a lot better than I am. Uh, for me, if I have to earn God's favor, if I have to earn his acceptance through anything that I do or don't do, I'm done for. That's not good news. That's horrible news. Right? A person who thinks that through their participation in God's mission, they are accumulating somehow more of God's favor, more of his acceptance, more of his blessing, that person can't share the gospel, actually, not effectively anyway, because that person in their heart doesn't believe the gospel. They don't, in their heart, know the good news that God's acceptance, God's favor, God's blessing is purchased for us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone. And nothing else, nothing that we do or don't do can change that. It can't be earned through any of our works, including our involvement in mission. So, there remains a question, why are we called to mission? It's not because God needs our help. It's not so that we can earn more of God's favor. Why are we called to mission? There was a missionary who lived in the 20th century. He served in South Africa. His name was David Bosch. He's with the Lord now. Uh, but he puts it this way, and I believe he puts it very well. He writes, God's people are a missionary people because God is a missionary God. God's people are a missionary people because God is a missionary God. In other words, mission is not just something that God gives us some kind of busy work to keep us out of trouble. Right? It's not just something that take it or leave it or maybe only for a few certain Christians. Mission is at the center of who God is. Mission is at the center of God's own heart. We could say that mission is the form that God's love takes in response to lost humanity. Think about that. Mission is the form that God's love takes in response to lost humanity. Why? Because when the beloved is in danger, love doesn't just sit on the couch and watch it die. Love doesn't just sit idly by, it goes up after the beloved, right? It goes to rescue the beloved. In other words, it goes on mission. So when we say that God is love, and I think we all know that, when we say that God is love, we could really just as easily say that God is a God on mission, because that's what love does. The gospel itself is, in fact, the story of God on mission, or what theologians call missio dei. It's just a Latin term translated. It means the mission of God, right? Jesus Christ is the ultimate missionary who left his home, left the glories that he was surrounded by, came into a world filled with people who didn't know him, filled with people who rejected him. He took on himself all of our cultural forms, right? Scripture says that he came in the likeness of men, and he poured out his life to rescue the beloved, us. So in answer to the question, why should we care about mission? The answer is that we can't care about God at all and not care about mission. If we care about God's heart, we must care about mission because God's heart is a heart of mission. If we really see the beauty the awesomeness of God's mission, which he accomplished for us in coming after us, in his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, we cannot remain apathetic to the mission which he continues to this day among the nations. 
It's impossible for us to really deeply believe the gospel of grace and remain indifferent to God's mission. Those two things don't work. On the flip side, if we would honestly look in our heart and say, I do find indifference, I do find apathy to God's mission, it's a warning sign that we've begun to forget the gospel. It's a warning sign that we've begun to forget God's mission for us. That our hearts have begun to grow cold towards the gospel itself, which again is the story of God on mission, and we're in need of repentance. God's call for us to join him on mission, then first and foremost, is an invitation to his own heart. The picture that we need to have when we think about God's call uh, for, for us to join him in his mission, um, it's important that we have the right picture of that. Perhaps we can get this impression in our mind that it's kind of like a boss doling out chores to him, his employees, right? That's not the right picture. It's not even the picture of a master and a servant, although the Bible sometimes uses that language. The most accurate picture that we could draw for what, what, what is happening when God is calling us to mission is the picture of a father inviting his beloved children to take part in some of his work. Um, my family and I, my wife and I, she's sitting back there, uh, we have two little kids. Abigail is six years old. Uh, and Isaac is four. Um, and I've noticed this interesting trend. Whenever I have to fix something around the house, uh, they're fascinated by this process, right? They always want to help. They're like, oh, dad's going to fix something, want to help. Fortunately, they're small enough not to realize that I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so that works out well for me. They think I'm Mr. Fix-It, and that's totally not true. But um, they want to help, right? Now, here's the question. Do I need their help? I might need somebody else's help, but do I need their help? Probably not, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is it often takes longer when they quote unquote help because I have to make sure they're not losing screws or cutting their fingers off or something else. Do I love them more because they help me? That's ridiculous, of course not. I love them just because they're my children. Then why do I want them there helping me? For this reason, just to enjoy being together. First and foremost, just to enjoy fellowship with them. Now get this. God has been on mission for a long time. Long before any of us ever showed up. Fortunately, the success of his mission does not depend on us. Right? In fact, truth be told, probably it takes longer because of our clumsy attempts at quote-unquote helping him. Right? Does he love us more? When we take part in that mission, of course not. He loves us because he has made us his children in Jesus Christ. Well, then why does he invite us to take part in his mission? Again, same reason. First and foremost, so that we can enjoy intimacy, unity with the heart of our Father, which is a heart of mission. The right biblical motive, then, for why we're called to mission, why we should care about mission is this, to be united with our Father's heart, first and foremost. Not out of fear or pride, not out of some hollow obligation or puffed up sense of our own self-importance, but out of a desire to enjoy intimacy and unity with our Father who is a God of mission and graciously invites us to take part in his work, not because he needs our help, but because he wants to bless us, because he wants to draw us near into his heart. So let's move on to the next question. Who is called to mission? I hope by now that you've realized the answer to this question is you, right? You are called to mission. Not that guy, not her, you are called to mission. Every single Christian is called to mission. Why? Because every single Christian is called to intimacy with the heart of God, which we've already said is a heart of mission. 
The call to take part in God's mission is actually a call to take part in the life and activity of the triune God himself. Mission, therefore, is not something that is optional for the Christian. It is not something that is peripheral. It's not something that only a select group of Christians should be involved in. Rather, it's something central and essential to what it means to follow Christ. A Christian who ignores mission is actually a Christian who ignores Christ. Because Christ is on mission, as we've already said. And any of us who claim to follow him, we have to follow him where he's going. And where is he going? On mission. Think about it this way. Christian growth is the process of us becoming uh, more and more conformed into the image of God, more and more like him in, in our character, right? And we've already said that God's character is that he is a God on mission. So what does that mean? It means that as long as we remain indifferent or apathetic to God's mission among the nations, there can be no real Christian growth in our lives. Why? Because we're not becoming more like him. Because he is a God of mission. We could even say, go so far as to say that God's image is mission. Why? Because Jesus Christ, the ultimate missionary, is the express image of God, Scripture says. Now you might have noticed by this point that I've been using the word mission in the singular, right? Mission, not missions. That's intentional. There's a reason for that. Uh, sometimes in Christian circles, there can arise a debate of whether we should focus our attention on missions, plural, meaning cross-cultural, foreign field, long-term missionary work, or whether we should focus on mission, singular, meaning living missionally, living on mission in our local context. The truth is, you guys, that that's a false dichotomy. There's no contradiction between those two things. In fact, we could say that global mission and local mission are two sides of the same gospel coin. If you're doing it right, you can't separate them. Right? There's no, there's no competition here. There ought not be any competition. Now, having said that, I do believe that we need to emphasize God's global mission to the nations. Why? It's not just because I'm a foreign field missionary and I want you guys to pay attention, all right? There's a biblical reason. Jesus himself emphasizes the global nature of his call to mission. Where we read in Matthew chapter 28, notice, he doesn't just say, go make disciples, though he could have said that. And it would have mostly made the same point. But what does he say? He said, Go make disciples of all nations. The word nations in Greek there literally is people groups. Go and make disciples of every people group on the planet. If you go to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus doesn't just tell his disciples, go preach the gospel. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So first of all, that global emphasis and emphasis that Jesus himself left for us as his disciples. But second of all, there's a very practical reason, um, and that practical reason is best summed up in a saying that we all know and probably use fairly frequently, out of sight, out of mind, right? Which means what? Which means that we, in our human nature, tend to focus on what's right in front of us. We tend to focus on the immediate, and if it's out there somewhere, it's easy to ignore, what does that mean for God's mission? It means that it's a lot harder to ignore the local mission, right? Why? Because we see lost people around us every day. We live in the context that we're in, and although some Christians manage to ignore even the local mission, we're not even going to get onto that, uh, it's a lot harder to do, right? But when it comes to God's global mission, when it comes to uh, people groups and nations that are literally across the world, we don't see them. They're not in front of us. And so it's very, very easy to just let that slip, just to neglect it. 
which is why we need to make a conscious effort to put that global mission in front of our, in front of our eyes, in front of our attention. So, we've laid out now that every Christian is called to mission. And I would just add, it's interesting to note in the book of Acts, we talked about local mission versus global mission. The church in Judea, for a while, they got stuck in just what we were talking about, right? They were preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. They were preaching the gospel in Judea. People were getting saved. It was great. And that was it. And they kind of forgot about that part where Jesus said, and to the ends of the earth. Until God in his providence allowed some persecution to be raised up. And then it says the disciples were scattered and they preached the gospel wherever they went. Again, it's easy to forget that part. So every Christian is called not only to local mission, which I hope we all know, but also every Christian is called to God's global mission. So the next logical question is, how can we be involved in God's global mission? Uh, and, and first off, again, in the sense of local mission, it's true, and we even heard earlier today, every one of us is called to be a missionary. If you didn't know that, congratulations, you're a missionary. All right, every single Christian is called to live, like we said, on mission in the context and culture in which God has placed us. That means that we seek to reflect Jesus, we seek to reflect the gospel in every area of our lives, not just on Sundays when we come together for worship. It means that we are to contextualize the gospel, is a word that theologians use. That means the gospel itself is timeless. It doesn't change. It's been the same for quite a few hundred thousand years now, right? A couple thousand years. Same gospel. It doesn't change, but it means that we present that gospel, we seek to communicate that gospel in ways that are timely, in ways that make sense to the culture that we're a part of. But besides being called as missionaries in the local mission, we're each and every one also called to participation in God's global mission. What does that look like? How can we be involved in God's global mission? I want to give you two ways that you can be involved. And there's only two. So pick one. There's only two. The first way to be involved in God's global mission? Go. Right? Go. We read it in Matthew 28. Jesus said it himself. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, having said that, I'll say this right away, not every Christian is called to foreign field long-term missions work, okay? Not even the majority of Christians are called to that. And yet, what I would challenge you with today is this, don't assume you're not. Don't assume you're not called to that. I think we have an assumption that we're not called. And unless we receive some kind of a vision where an angel comes down on a cloud with a trumpet from heaven and says, go to Zambia, wherever that is, then, well, if I don't have something like that, well, then, of course, I'm not called to long-term foreign field missions. There's a man who lived in the 20th century. His name was Robert Speer. He wrote an article uh, titled A Missionary Call. Uh, he was involved in promoting foreign missions work his whole life. Uh, and I want to read you an excerpt from this article. Uh, this is actually an article that I read before I went long-term onto the foreign mission field. And Spear writes this. If men are to have special calls for anything, they ought to have special calls to go about their own business to have a nice time all their lives, to choose the soft places to make money and to gratify their own ambitions. Is it not absurd to suggest that a special call is necessary to become a missionary, but no call is required at all to gratify your own will or ambition? There is a general obligation resting upon Christians to see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached to the world. You and I need no special call to apply that general call of God to our lives. We do need a special call to exempt us 
from its application to our lives. In other words, every one of us stands under a presumptive obligation to give his life to the world unless we have a special exemption. Challenging, right? He, he hammers it pretty hard. And understand, I don't believe that what Spear meant is that every Christian without thinking or without praying should just spin a globe, stick your finger in it, and move somewhere. But what he is challenging us with is this. We have a double standard. We have a double standard. When it comes to doing something, like moving across the world, to preach the gospel to other nations, we require all kinds of confirmation. But when it comes to doing what's comfortable for us, what comes easy to us, what really doesn't take a lot of effort to do, we generally speaking don't require the same level of confirmation. And that's a double standard. And we need to repent of it. The point is that we should all live only according to God's calling on our life. Whatever that is. For somebody, maybe that is going to the foreign missionary field. For somebody else, God's calling is for them uh, to work at a school or a bank or wherever and preach the gospel there. But the problem is that we don't require the same level of confirmation to do one as we do the other, generally speaking. One great way to find out, just to, to open yourself and say, all right, Lord, you know, is that something you want me to do? Is that something you're calling me to do, to be involved in long-term foreign field missionary work? One great way to get a taste and, and sort of get your feet wet is to go on a short-term mission strip. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot of you probably have done that. Uh, maybe some of you are considering doing that uh, and even was mentioned that you guys are doing a trip this summer. Um, that's a great way for you to, to just get a sense of what God's doing across the globe. And even if on that trip, uh, wherever it would be, even if during that trip God confirms to your heart, yeah, uh, you're not called to long-term foreign field missionary work. Nevertheless, that experience uh, can broaden your heart, expand your heart more to be involved in the other way in God's global mission. Remember, we said there's two ways, not just one. Uh, if anybody is ever interested in coming to Ukraine to test the waters... We'd be happy to have you. Come on over, check it out. We'll show you what it's like. But the second way is this. The first way is to go. And the second way is this. If God calls you, if he gives you that exemption that we talked about, and he calls you not to be a long-term foreign field missionary, then he is calling you to send. Right? And that was even mentioned earlier. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, how shall they preach unless they are sent? There's a man named Neil Parolo, and he's written an excellent book on this idea. It's called Serving as Senders. Uh, and the idea is basically what was mentioned before, that every Christian is called to involvement in God's global mission, either as a goer or as a sender. One of the two. There are no other options. Passing the buck to somebody else, saying, oh, somebody else will take care of that, that's not an option. Saying that, oh, well, missions, that's just, that's just for some people over there, that's not an option. Unless not following Christ is an option. And I hope that's not an option for any of you here today. So what does it look like practically to be a sender then? Uh, if you're really interested, I would suggest getting uh, Neil Perolo's book. Again, it's called Serving as Senders, and he goes into great depth on what that means, what that look like, looks like. Um, but what I'd like to do now is tell you a bit about where we're at in Ukraine, tell you a bit about God's work in Svitlovotsk, um, and give you some practical ways that you can be involved in, in that work in Ukraine. Uh, but these ways would also be applicable to any other missionary or mission field that God might lay in your heart. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, I've been in Ukraine for over 11 years now. Um, the city that my family and I are in, we've been in for coming up on eight years uh, since we started the very first Bible study there. Uh, the name of the city is Svitlovotsk. That's a little bit tricky, I realize. It's kind of a tongue twister. There's a trick to remembering it. Are you guys ready? Uh, sweet and low, 
right? Little pink packets that give you cancer. You guys know these? Yes? Right? So sweet and low. Take the N out. You don't need it. It's just sweet, low, right? Come on. Sweet, low. And then think Volks like a Volkswagen, all right? So it's sweet, low, Volks. Congratulations, you speak Russian. Sweet. Now, the image that will get that name stuck in your head forever, picture a little VW bug driving down the highway covered in sweet and low packets. Just like duct taped on there, you know? So, sweet, low, Volks, all right? That's where we live. Um, it's a little city of 50,000 people. It's actually my wife's hometown where she grew up. Um, again, coming up on eight years ago, we began the first Bible study in our apartment there. Uh, and since that time, God has graciously raised up a vibrant, growing church. Uh, the name of the church is Calvary Chapel Svitlovotsk. Um, it's spelled a little bit differently maybe than you thought it was going to be spelled. No sweet low. Um, but that's how it's spelled. Uh, and the vision of our church is simply this. Enjoy Jesus, stand fast in grace, live in love, and reach the world. The last point being mission, of course. Uh, and we believe that that is a vision that Ukraine is desperately in need of. Um, Ukraine as a country, it's a, it's a fairly large country as far as Europe goes. It's 45 million people. Um, but officially, the population in Ukraine is less than 4% evangelical. That means that out of 45 million people, there are less than 2 million evangelical believers. Uh, and just to give you something to compare that with, uh, officially anyway, here in the United States, uh, there's a 29% evangelical population. We all know that's not true. But that's at least people who've been exposed to evangelical Christianity. That's at least people who would somewhat affiliate themselves with evangelical Christianity. In Ukraine, even that official number is less than 4%. But the sad truth is that many, if not a majority, of those quote-unquote evangelical churches in Ukraine are not preaching the gospel. They're preaching legalism. They're preaching dead traditions. They're preaching uh, false theology, prosperity theology, name it, claim it, is very big there. So we have been blessed to see God raise up in our city uh, a body of people who are rooted in the gospel, rooted in the word, love grace, uh, in spite of me, not because of me. And just because people ask this question always anyway, uh, our church is about, including kids, about 70 people. And again, it's not about the numbers, but it is about more and more people meeting Jesus. And so those numbers aren't just numbers. They're people whose lives are being transformed by the gospel. So we desire to see those numbers grow. Not so we can name a number, but so that Jesus Christ would be more glorified in our city. Uh, now, we mentioned a few, that there's a few different ways to be involved on the sending side of things. I want to give you a few of those ways practically uh, that you can be involved with uh, what we're doing in Svitlovotsk, Ukraine, uh, or, again, they would be applicable to any missionary or mission field God might put on your heart. The first way is simply pray. Pray, right? Pretty simple. Something that every Christian can do, something that every Christian should do. Uh, and I honestly believe that we would not be experiencing so much of God's blessing there if it weren't for all the people praying for us. I love when we uh, come back to visit the States once every few years and people will come up to me who, honestly, I don't remember their names if I ever knew them in the first place. But they, you know, they say, you know, we're praying for God's work in your city. And you know what? I might not remember their name, but God knows their name. And God hears their prayers and he's answering their prayers. And he loves to answer their prayers. So we would encourage you, please pray for God's work in Svitlovotsk, in Ukraine as a whole. Uh, and a few big prayer requests you can see up here uh, would be for spirit-filled leaders, that God would raise up spirit-filled spirit leaders in the church, specifically men uh, who would be able to lead their families well and hence lead the church well. Pray for the salvation of lost souls. Again, best case scenario, 96% of our city is lost and going to hell. Best case scenario. So pray that God would pour out his spirit on our city, that he would bring in the lost, uh, not only for our city, but for Ukraine as a whole. Pray also for deep community for those who are in our church, uh, that they would get plugged into community groups that we do throughout the week. I know you guys do that, do that here too. Um, 
just as a way to grow as a body and loving one another. Um, Pray also for church planting. Uh, Again, there's many cities in Ukraine that don't even have a solid Bible teaching, gospel preaching church. So pray that God would raise up laborers and send them. Uh, One uh, village about a half an hour away from our city, I'm not going to give you the name of that one because you're not going to pronounce it anyway. So uh, God knows what it's called. Don't worry about it. Uh, But there's a little village about a half an hour away from our city. Um, And uh, we've recently, about I think six months ago, we began a Bible study there. Uh, And since then, we've been seeing both believers and unbelievers coming. Uh, We've seen some people give their lives to the Lord since we began that. Uh, So pray specifically for that work uh, and what God would want to do there. There's a couple other areas in the surrounding region that we're praying specifically for. So pray that God would raise up uh, gospel preaching churches. Um, And then pray also for Christ-centered media. Um, Again, because there is so little solid teaching, Um, Hence, there is a lack of solid biblical teaching materials. And one thing that we do at our church is we put all of our content up on the web, uh, all of our sermons, we do a podcast, we do videos, um, and we've been blessed to see God multiply that as well. Uh, I teach in Russian there. Our city is primarily Russian-speaking, although in Ukraine they speak both Ukrainian and Russian. Um, And so we've seen God multiply that and people actually from all across the former Soviet Union who also speak Russian uh, downloading those sermons, hopefully being built up in the word. So pray that God would continue to bless that ministry. Um, There's a few publishing projects that we kind of have in the works. Pray for those. And then personally, uh, just for our family, if you would pray uh, for health and financial provision. Uh, Health is a big area of attack for us. It seems that uh, almost any time I'm invited to go to some conference and speak or go to some other church and share, like clockwork, somebody in our family gets sick. Uh, So please pray just for God's protection in that area. Um, And pray that God would simply continue to be faithful as he has been in providing for our family materially. Uh, And that leads to a second way that you can be involved, uh, which is to be involved in financial support. The truth is that in Ukraine over the last four years, uh, there's been a lot of economic change, a lot of inflation. Um, Prices on some very basic goods have more than doubled, literally. Um, And that has had its effect. So currently, uh, we're at about 65% of our long-term regular support goal, which means we're hoping to raise uh, about another $900 a month in regular support. Now, I want to talk to you really practically on this point. And I believe you guys will hear my heart. Um, I was not always a foreign field missionary, right? I would sit in church just like you guys are sitting there. And missionaries from time to time would come and share uh, at my church uh, in Indianapolis, which is where I'm originally from. Um, You know, and and I would hear and and my heart would go out to them. And they'd also share about some needs that they'd have. And and I'd sit there and I'd think, well, you know, that's that's cool. But, you know, I'm, I'm a poor Bible college student. I've got like five bucks in my pocket. And I'm embarrassed to give them five bucks. So I'm just not going to give anything. That's not biblical, right? Because the Bible says if there's first a willing heart, then it's accepted according to what you do have, not according to what you don't have. So if what God has allowed you to do, if what God has put on your heart at this point to do is to give $5 towards global missions somewhere, great. Praise God for that. If that's to Ukraine, praise God for that. If that's somewhere else, praise God for that. But I would encourage you to do this. Pray, seek the Lord, and get involved in giving to missions somewhere. Why? Not because God needs your help. Remember? We talked about that. He's not going to go bankrupt without you. Don't worry. He'll be fine. Then why? At least for this reason. Jesus said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? So when we give to mission, wherever that is, our hearts are more closely knit to God's mission. And God's heart, we said, is a God of mission. And I believe that God would have our hearts more closely knit to his heart. So pray, seek God, and get involved in giving to mission somewhere. And if the Lord lays it on your heart that that's our mission in Ukraine, uh, there's information for how you can be involved. Um, and if you want to ask more questions afterwards, you can come up and ask. Um, the third way that we would encourage you to get involved with, with our work in Ukraine is simply to connect with us. 
Um, the best way probably would be just to go on, if you do Facebook, to go on and like our Facebook page, which the address is up there. Um, that would be the most updates, prayer requests, news, pictures, sermon excerpts, etc. Um, if you don't do Facebook, good for you. Um, if, if you do Twitter for some very strange reason, I don't know why anybody uses Twitter, but we do have one of those too, so you can do that as well. Um, and if you hate the internet as a whole, <laughs> kudos. Um, we also have other ways of communicating. Uh, one way that we would encourage you to do is to come up. We have a little table set up over there. Um, after the service, come up to us. We have some prayer magnets that you can grab. You don't even need an internet connection. Okay, grab a prayer magnet. Uh, it is magnetic, so you can go home, slap it on your fridge, and when you go for your midnight snack and you're praising God for that beautiful donut in your hand, we'll be, we'll be there watching you. Um, and, and you can pray for us at the same time. So grab a prayer magnet. Um, I would ask because we're actually, people have taken so many that we actually only have a few left. So please take only one per family. Thank you. But do make sure you get one. Um, and then also we send out an email newsletter quarterly with some more in-depth news and prayer requests and testimonies from people from our church. If you'd like to receive that, you can also sign up for that. Uh, at the table after service. Um, so thank you guys for your attention. Thank you for your time. I want to pray for us now, just that God would stir our hearts for his mission and that he would bind our hearts more closely to his heart of mission. All right?